The Bible says that demons know who Jesus is and when they hear the name of Jesus, they tremble. See, they're authorized by knowing who he is and they stay away from the person who is authorized because they know when they use the name, it has power. The blood of the lamb is what gives the name power. You're not authorized to use the name unless you understand what the blood is and whose blood it was. Reading about it doesn't authorize you to use it. Unless the blood has cleansed you, you've got no right to use it. If I haven't been cleansed by the blood, how can I possibly use the name? Using the name is empowered by the blood and the blood was shed by Jesus and Jesus' blood was the Father's blood which was God. Therefore, the power is in the inheritance which was the blood of the Father which was God. Right? Most people recognize that an inheritance is passed down from the Father's blood supply. Right? Is that correct? Okay. The Lord spoke about it in John 8. It said, Jesus talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, we're talking about the religious leaders, okay? Because right now, you've got to understand it's the religious leaders that are causing all the trouble. The religious leaders versus the body of Christ. The religious leaders, now we're we're talking about the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jewish hierarchy under the Old Testament. They have been replaced now by Antichrist. Antichrist is still religious. Religare comes from a Latin word which means to bind your hands. It means to tie you up with legalisms to the point where you won't be able to do anything without the permission of those who are the religious leaders. Antichrist will ultimately be the, the religious leader and his false prophet will be the spiritual oversight globally. I believe that's going to be the Pope. They have two billion people under their control. Muslims, yes, but not as wide as spread because the Catholic faith has been spread for the last 600 years, 700 years. All over the New World, the Spanish, French, everywhere all over the world. So ultimately, the Antichrist needs one spiritual oversight that is a puppet that will do what he wants him to do. Because it's always referred to as the false prophet. He is the one who bids the bidding, the religious bidding of the Antichrist. He becomes part of the Antichrist system, political, economic and spiritual. The spiritual part will be headed up by the the, uh, the, uh, anti- the uh, false prophet. And the religious, the uh, uh, political side will be held up by the Antichrist and his political leaders, the 12 or the 14, eventually down to uh, 10 uh, political heads, and the economic system, which will be the new euro currency, uh, which will be worldwide, and the other currencies will eventually be squeezed out. In John 8, right? And he, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, because you can't make sense to a religious leader. Listen to this John chapter 8, verses 43 and 44. And now I'm going to give it to you the way God gave it to me, okay? And then we're going to, we're going to connect it back up. We know that when, it, it's like, we, we, when we connect with Jesus Christ, the reality of who he is, and we'll get to that in a sec, I promise, the body and the blood, when we, when we connect to the body and the blood, and we start to recognize who indeed, who indeed Jesus is, and when we start connecting to that, and recognizing the importance of realizing who the body is and who the blood is and who Jesus is and we start connecting to the name name that's above every name and when we open our mouth and that name comes out demons tremble, the devil backs up and prayers start getting answered. In other words, they've been authorized spiritually by a high spiritual power, an angelic power, Satan, to help organize and give energy to, energize the anti-Christian press that's called apostasy, to draw people away from the connection that they have with Jesus Christ. Now they can use his name as they don't have the power. Do you not understand my speech? Then he says, why? In brackets, because you are not able to listen to my word. Now when you read that in the Greek, and I've read it in the Greek, this is what he says. Why why can't you understand what I'm saying to you? The answer is because you are not able to understand my words. You want to hear what I'm saying, but you are interpreting it in your own way. The Bible, Paul calls it itching ears. Now you know why the people fall away. It's called the great falling away, the great, the apostasy. This is where people have lost the ability to hear what God's Spirit is trying to teach people who say they want to learn. They want to hear, but they want to hear what they want to learn. They don't want to hear what God wants them to learn. Beware, the cosmos is coming. The word cosmos is a word in the Greek. It's a world without recognition and alienated from God. It's a word without the recognition of and alienated from God. A world recognition, a world without the recognition of 
and alienated from God. Beware of your spiritual surroundings. What does that mean? Jesus said the cosmos, which is a, is, a, is a word in the Greek which means the organized surroundings of the globe, mankind included. It's, it's the organization by man of man encapsulated within this world system or within the globe, the world as we would know it, without recognition of and alienated from, withdrawn from the God who created it. And that Cosmos is what we are left with when we remove God from it. Now, when we remove God from the cosmos or from man's created world, the one who takes over is man himself. Man now takes charge of the world which he believes now he has created. There we come into a system of organization which is man-controlled. Atheistic, some people would call it. I call it self-governed. Where man makes the rules, man enforces the rules. If we try to bring God into it, who is a higher level of understanding and intelligence, then we have to remove him first if we're going to take over. All right. Don't you understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Next verse. Listen to this. See if you get any revelation out of that one. You are of your father, the devil. Talking to the religious leaders, talking to Antichrist, talking to all kind of different religious leaders. You are of your father, the devil. He's virtually saying, you got your father, I got mine. And the desires of your father, that's what you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Now listen to that. He was a murderer from the beginning. And who's he talking about? Satan. And from the beginning, he, did not, he does not or did not stand in the truth. Therefore, he is what? If you don't stand in the truth, what do you do? You're a liar. That's right. And because there is no truth in him, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources because there's no truth in him. Now, let's, I'll tell you what I get in a minute, and you tell me if you agree. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. In other words, he can't give you what he hasn't got. For he was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Quickly, what does a father do? Why would we call one person a father and not another? What does a father do? A father provides seed. Not the woman that provides the seed. The woman nurtures the seed. The father provides the seed. The father either provides good seed or bad seed when it comes to spiritual things. All seed brings life, right? We can have good seed and a fruit, and some of that seed will produce good things, some seed will produce bad things, but it all produces some kind of life. Seeds produce weeds, seed produce fruit. Is that right? Okay. Seed can produce, spiritually speaking, always produces a harvest, but sometimes that spiritual seed is bad, Sometimes a spiritual seed is good. We call bad seed hybrid seed. God never created any hybrid seed until out of the Garden of Eden, right? So then we started to get hybrid seed, which was a mixture of Cain and Abel. And then we had all the different histories of spiritual seed, Cain and Abel. Then we got all the, from the uh, Cain and Abel and the, the, the breakdowns of all the seeds that started producing the uh, the uh, Palestinians and the Israelis, so you had the Canaanites, the Ishmaelites, and all the other ites. All of those different breakups of the seed came from different fathers because the, the, the genealogy comes from the father. Is that right? So when you have a spiritual seed that is evil and wicked, it cannot produce good seed until it comes from a different father line. Make sense? Now, in this situation here where we have fathers that produce a bad seed, they produce liars, right? The same thing in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the enemy or, or the Antichrist system. We have to be able to, or Satan has to be able to break down and remove the system that produces spiritual fathers from the good ones, from the bad ones. Antichrist spirit has to come from Antichrist fathers, bad seed. In order to get bad seed, we have to remove the good seed. Does that make sense? So what Jesus is saying is here, you are from bad seed. Therefore, you can't, listen to this, you can't receive anything of value from me because you can't receive good from evil. Evil can't receive anything from good. Therefore, when you listen to me, you can't receive anything that makes you better because you can't hear it. Uh, John chapter 6, beginning around verse uh, 53. Now Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now let's look at this just really quick. I will embellish on this so that you'll get it better. When we think of flesh and what do we think of blood, we think of A, Jesus is talking about not his flesh, but God's flesh. And blood 
always refers to, going back to Leviticus, the life is in the blood. Blood, life, body, God. We cannot picture the body of God, although it is described. We consider God a spiritual being. In order for God to have a physical flesh body, we have to relate that to Jesus. Because Jesus was born of woman, right? Therefore, when we think of of God's body, we have to relate to it in the form of Jesus Christ, who was born of a woman. Born of a woman, fleshly body, whose father was of the Spirit, Holy Spirit. The seed of God impregnated into the womb of a woman. The result was a flesh, blood, and bone body, human, yet whose father was God. Therefore he, Jesus, was God. Therefore when he's saying, whosoever will eat my body and drink my blood sounds like a cannibalistic act. But if you are thinking like a spiritual person, you will realize he is talking about God the Father. His father was him. Therefore, he says, whoever eats my flesh, whoever partakes of me, is partaking of God. You cannot partake of me. You cannot become, I cannot become part of you. Therefore, you cannot become part of God unless you become part of me. We are one and the other. We're together. Therefore, if you're going to say, in the name of Jesus, you have to become part of me. vis V part of God. You and God have to be one. The only way you can become one with God is to become one with me. You have to be born again. You have to be, um, become part and relate to God's body. And the only way you can do that is to become part of one with my body. That's all. Breaking it down to the most simplistic terms, that's the only way you can become one with God to become one with, his, with Jesus' body. If you want to become one with Jesus, you've got to become one with, connected to, part of, imbibed with his body. You have to become so interrelated with Jesus Christ that you could say with yourself, I feel what he feels. He is what I, I am. I am what he is. He is part of me. I cannot relate to God unless I relate to Jesus. When I think of God, I think of Jesus. I can't separate the two. The three are one. But in order to recognize that and understand it, you've got to be a spiritually minded person. See? That's why Jesus said, why, why do you keep wanting to connect Roman images with a living God? The kingdom of God is not here nor there. See what he was trying to say? You're trying to relate to spiritual issues here by considering a geographical location for the kingdom. Where if you really understood spiritual issues, you'd be listening to me from the voice of one who speaks from heaven. And how, how can I relate to you? I just read it to you in John. How can I relate to you When the words that I'm speaking to you, you don't want to hear them because they are so much above you because you are not tuned into the frequency of heaven. You're tuned into the frequency of religion. That's why when people, when when you come to a place and the broadcast is from heaven, but you come in tuned into the frequency of the cosmos, you lose interest pretty quick because it requires an effort to retune. You've You've got to throw out the old receiver, which is religious. Whoever eats my flesh has eternal life and I'll raise him up at the last day. There's the promise. You get to know me. You get to know God. Your name's in the book. Don't worry about anything else. I'll bring you through to the last day. And I'll give you eternal life. How will you know that? How can I, how can I be sure of that? Because that's what I have promised you. Next verse. For my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. What's he saying there? The life of God and the body of God, which is me, is all you need. If you got that, everything that comes with God is yours. The study to show yourself approved is one thing, but the relationship with God is something that you have to ingest. It comes if you just want it. Stop trying so hard to get it and God will give it to you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. You see, he just said it there. The living Father sent me, see, God the Father sends me as, as his body. You see that? And I live because of the Father. He sends his body so he can live through me. So what I'm telling you is scriptural. And he who feeds on me will live because of me. God couldn't send his body down to die on the cross for you because God can't die. And and Satan knew God can't die. But what Satan didn't figure on was God sending the Son and giving the Son a human body. Because Satan figured you give the Son a human body, then the sin of mankind will be transferred onto The son made sense. So God said, true, except I'm going to be the father. All of this, my brothers and sisters, my dear children of God, 
All of this is to encourage you. You cannot be separated from the love of God, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't ever think that you can, you can lose what you cannot lose. You can lose a name. You cannot lose the body. Where the body is, that's where the eagles will be gathered. Jesus said in the last days, wherever the eagles are gathered, it shouldn't have been translated, uh, um, um, uh, it actually should have been translated eagles, where the eagles are gathered, which are always a type of the church, there will the body be also, or the carcass. In this case, it's not carcass, it's the body or the body of the lamb, Jesus Christ, which is not the dead body, the risen body. In other words, wherever the body of God is, the risen body of God, that's where the body of Christ will be, Amen. because they've eaten the body. Let me do this. I'll finish with this, right? John, and we'll come back and hit it again. John chapter 16. I want you to read the whole of that chapter again. That'll help me a lot to, to get to some pertinent points. John chapter 6, all the way through verse 68. And then this one here, talking about the name of Jesus, because I kicked it around a bit. I want to clarify it for you. Uh, John 16, verses 20, 20 through 24. John 16, 20 through 24. Check this out. Jesus speaking, of course, saints, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. Hear what he's saying? This is a time of, of when the body of Christ is going through a lot. More particularly, the loss of Christ when Jesus is returned back to heaven. But the world will rejoice because I'm gone. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will eventually be turned into joy. Next verse. A woman, when she is in labor, now this is interesting, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has being born into the world. Next verse. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. He knew he, had, he was going to be withdrawn, and he knew that the world, who should have been rejoicing with them, was going, to be, was going to be glad, rather, to see him go. But he said, you who really know me, now listen carefully, who have eaten my body and drunk my blood, you who are related to me and who understand me and are connected to me. He uses the simile of a, of a mother birthing a child. He said, I feel about you like a mother. Now you mothers can relate to that. I feel about you like a mother. I, I've held you in my belly. I've birthed you. I've held you in my arms. And you're the closest thing in the world to me. But while I was getting ready to birth you, all I felt was pain and anguish and fear. Now I'm holding you in my arms and I'm already missing you. I've got you in my arms, but I'm still missing you. And he says, but I will see you again now that you've been birthed. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy nobody will take away from you again. Like your mother, you and I will be separated. But don't worry. You are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That was the first marriage right next one he said but you are body you are, you are my body and you are my blood next verse and in that day you will ask me nothing this is when we were united again this is this time period we're in now christian time period most assuredly i say to you whatever now listen carefully whatever you ask the father in my name my name he will give to you now remember what i said to you jesus christ's body was god's body and i explained pretty carefully to you why that was necessary how it was brought to pass right now notice Jesus drew the simile between the, the, the baby and Jesus and the fact that the, the, the mother or Jesus bore the body the body which is you God the father whose body became Jesus would be separated right and it says but don't worry I will see you again then Jesus said don't it says don't ask me ask the father right now why did he do that because he said, my body is not my body, it's God's body. You're going to ask that house, daddy, right? Okay, to use my name because it's his body. Ask the father, because whatever you ask him, okay, daddy, I want to ask a blessing. I need something from the son, your body, Jesus Christ, my savior. See, I'm going to ask now in his name because he's the authority. He says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Do you see the relationship you have to have yes. with Jesus Christ, the body of God, before you have the privilege of asking for God to grant you a blessing in that name? Yes. Therefore, whatsoever things you ask in his name, Jesus' name, my Father will grant it to you. On the basis of what? Relationship? And the fact that you have labored, eaten his Jesus' body, and drunk his blood. Yeah. 
Now do you, see, when I wrote this down, I was shaken because God said people don't realize the price that had to be paid for them in order for them to be granted access to that name. They throw it out there like it's nothing. And then they wonder why it's not granted because somehow they think, oh, it's just granted to me to call on that name anytime I want and it's never cost me nothing because they confuse salvation with blessing. Salvation is one form of blessing. It's redemption from sin. That the price that was paid on that cross was access. It was access. It was the right to access. It doesn't give you the responsibility to call upon that access unless you are already have the uh, authorization for it. Because there's one who has the power of attorney and the one who is working every day, 24 hours a day, to defeat you in a court of law, and that's Satan. Read the book of Job. He has the right. Satan still has the right to challenge you on the basis of the book. You say you're a Christian, so what? You have to prove in the courts of spiritual law that you have a right. And that spiritual law doesn't go on what a man thinks or doesn't think. It goes on what the courts of heaven decree and declare as truth. Remember what we talked about in John 8. Jesus said, you have no ability to hear what I'm saying to you because you don't want to hear what I'm saying to you. Therefore, any judgment you make, any decision you make is a lie because you're a, father, you're a liar and your father is a liar. But you shall know the truth. And the truth is what will set you. The truth is literally in the Greek, the truth is the key that unlocks a prison door. And Satan has no lock that can relock it again. Once you unlock a truth, there is no key that can lock it again. Once you've unlocked the truth, it stays unlocked. And it's that truth that you unlock that you can beat the devil's brains out with. But that truth doesn't come easy. Satan will try every trick in the book to get you to accept the lie by, by sugarcoating it, gold plating it, by giving you an alternative, by making you compromise one little thing so that when you come to the point of asking something in the name of Jesus and it's flawed and you wonder, why, 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 why wasn't that accessible? Now I'm just talking about something little, something that was majorly important, something that you don't want to let go, something on the inside of you that won't let go. You've got to look for it for its authenticity. 